I am, I am so excited and I am so humbled to share this, um, this revolutionary material. You're, you're one of my first audiences since my book was published just a couple weeks ago. So, and you know how it's a daunting process at best. Um, the purpose of this book was not to find an excuse to get away for 10, 12, 20 hours away from the, my five kids, two teenagers. You know what I'm saying for those of you who have teenagers. Um, but I wrote this book because I thought that I was spiritual. I always thought I was such a spiritual person. And I had a beloved grandmother who was always very religious and always very spiritual. And she seemed to have the formula. She seemed to know the way towards awakening, enlightenment. She knew how to plug into her bliss. And I thought as a little girl that if she knew the way, I could be under her tutelage and find the way towards my happiness. And she always told me, Jennifer, there's a better place than this. And I said to myself, well, that's interesting because, you know, what's wrong with this place? Is it, is it bad? I just got here. And she would also say to me, don't get too comfortable in, into the material pleasures of the world. You know, don't partake in too much of, of the, the material abundance because that will also keep you from this better place. And I thought, okay, that's already a no see, no touch policy. So this is already no fun. And she also told me that the body will, it'll want yearnings and pleasures, that the material world will, will it, you will be wanting to plug in and the desires that will keep you from, from this better place that she was talking about. So from the get go, I questioned this because I thought, didn't a greater power than me create all this stuff, this, this beauty, this wonder. And I, I, I felt this intrinsic sense of guilt, like already seep inside. What, what was it that I was made of that could be so wrong that already was, was bad. It was already missing. I had to, I was just got here, but I already had to go to this better place. And I, tried this formula, but it, it, it didn't work. And I looked around and there was a lot of other people it wasn't working for good for as well. In fact, there was a dismal success rate. And I came to the startling conclusion that either we were all hopeless, broken failures, or the formula for enlightenment was wrong. So are you ready? Are you ready <laughs> to take this journey with me for the next Hour. I want to hear I'm ready. ready. Are you ready? <laughs> Good, because we're going to go on this, on this journey. And it's going to be a little bit of a startling revelation at best. I mean, how many of us, how many of you have ever been in yoga class and you get back in your car the next minute and you're screaming at the person in front of you, you, you know, get off the road, grandpa. I mean, you got anything else better to do? I mean, how many of you find yourself or even at this seminar yesterday, and you're, you're feeling like you're listening to uh, the inspirational talks, you feel like your consciousness is raised, and you get home, and the moment someone says, well, you look tired. Did you, did you gain some weight? Or, or your kid comes in and says, you know, mom, I, 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 I finger painted the walls. Or I, I you know, it's just the, the smallest things. Can, can bring us in a tailspin, and we can find ourselves not being able to plug in for days, weeks, lifetimes. And, and I wonder, what is it, why is it that something that should be so natural should seem so hard to plug into? Why should something that should be so intrinsic, so hard to get to, I mean, after all, there are, there are billions of antidotes out there. The, the self-help industry is $11 billion strong with the latest antidotes, self-help books, seminars, workshops, 10-step plans, you name it. 
But, but all these solutions are aimed at someone who has a problem. And I keep thinking, but do I have a problem? That means something's missing with me. Something, something is going to keep me out there, always seeking, seeking and searching for a solution out there, but isn't it, always ha isn't it all going on in here? And after all, this keeps me on a never-ending hamster wheel of solutions, constantly searching and seeking. It, it's addicting because there's always something new to get. And that's maybe why nothing works. Because how can enlightenment be a 10-step plan you can memorize when it's, a, when it's a revelation of what was already there? You cannot become what you already are. You cannot become what you already are because you already are awakened. You already are awakened. And so was that waiter and your mother-in-law and your ex-husband and everybody around you. Just like you cannot be semi-pregnant, you cannot become semi-awakened. Just like you cannot be semi-pregnant, you cannot be semi-awakened. It's part and parcel of who you are. It's the nature, it's the framework of your existence. There are no hopeless failures in, in, in a world of imperfect perfections. And, and we were never late because the universe was never a timekeeper. It, it's like the, ro is the rose is still a rose, whether it, it's in a seed stage or fully blossomed. At every stage, at every outward appearance, it is still expressing its whole potential, its whole potential. It is still a rose. And just, just like we are, even if we are dormant in a, in a seed stage we, or we're fully blossomed, we are still expressing our whole potential. We are still all right as we are. And, and a guru, there's no difference between the guru or the seeker. They're both awakened. They're both awakened. But it's just the guru who has realized it. So what, what words, let me just say something. Words bind or remind us of who we are. Words, I want you to remember that. Words are thoughts and they bind or remind us of who we are. I know you remember that, because you were here. And we have been taught to believe that there is a large portion of us, a large portion of us, I mean, our physical bodies, we inherited these. We were born into a physical body, and we were taught that these were dense, that they're inferior, and they're basically keeping us from becoming clearer. They're basically keeping us from ascending, from achieving higher states of consciousness. Most spiritual and religious teachings teach us that in order to become more holy, to be, in order to become more clear, to ascend, we must transcend this physical body and this physical world that we live in. I mean, basically, that's, that's the gist of it. But, but I want to know why would the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-neutral force of life have put so much stock into this physical package if there weren't a purpose to it? Did, did, don't you ever want to know that? The most teachings, it, it's interesting because we have, we're made of several, I mean, we're spiritual, we're emotional, we're physical. We're, we're several components, but yet we've been taught that there's only one way. You, you go to a workshop, an average seminar, but you'll be taught that there's only one way to, to have a meaningful existence, and that's through all our spiritual essence, our ethereal essence. Now, that's a, that's a big challenge because you can't see, you can't feel it, you can't hear it, you can't touch that. So it's a great challenge for those who want a meaningful existence. And And... What's more is we've been taught that there's only a few qualified people who can show us the way out of this, this sort of doomed, miserable existence we've been born into, this lower 
dense existence that it's keeping us from becoming more clearer. The, these religious authorities or spiritual authorities, shamans, ministers, priests, etc., they have the techniques who can show us the way out of this existence that we've been born into. They have the techniques. And these are the techniques that, that we've been given, that we've pen, passed along onto us. The, the formulas, the 10 step plans, et cetera, et cetera. And we take this for face value. But I don't see, I don't really see the success rate. If it were, if it were able to be bought in a book, wouldn't we all be enlightened by now? I, I don't see, I don't see that success rate. So, <laughs> Words, they, they bind or remind us of who we are. And what's more is this, this the bot, we accept this formula without a question. We become addicted to these outside solutions. And as Albert Einstein once wisely said, you cannot solve a problem at the same level of awareness that created it. And right now, our consciousness is still continuing to solve problems at the level that we are broken because it still offers solutions at our brokenness. Because if you'll see, in the, in the, all of these solutions are aimed at someone who has a problem. We didn't have a problem to begin with. If you are awakened, and you believe it, you will not aim towards those solutions. Those solutions are aimed at someone who has something missing, who needs something to be fixed, who has a problem. That's why nothing ever works. We don't need more therapy. We need more clarity. Could that be why nothing's working? Could it be that the formula for enlightenment could be, could be backwards? The reason I have a, a problem with this is because there's a flaw in this argument. Let, let's just go, let me just say something here. We didn't just get plopped down like some aliens from outer space. I mean, well, maybe your ex-husband did or something like that. That's okay. But, but we, did, we didn't just get plopped down here. Your ancestors are not your aunts and uncles and your cousins that you typically think of. Like, you know, Aunt Minnie and Uncle Tom or whoever. Your ancestry dates much farther back from than that. It's much more precious. 13.7 billion years ago, the first atoms and molecules formed us as a homogenous collective whole. And we have been we have been unraveling particle by particle ever since. How could anything that the universe has been unraveling particle by precious particle, have anything in it that is intrinsically sinful, broken, indecent, flawed, or wrong. Our bodies are the first garment that we wear when we enter here. They house the wondrous instrumentation that, that works from the very first moment of life. They allow us to taste the honey, to attend the seminar, to touch the cheek of the child, to experience nature and the sunset. They have sailed us across the vast ocean of time and space. Can you imagine if all the butterflies and the birds plucked their feathers because they wanted to be more holy? Or if all the peacocks said to one another, I, 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 gotta, I gotta pluck my wings because I'm gonna gain more spiritual ground. Or, I know you'll love this, if, if the trees said to one another, no, 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 I don't want any water or sunshine. I must not partake in the physical world. I must wither and die to be more holy. It, it is absurd. And where did this come from? Why are we... Where, where did these, this original thought process come from? How did it get handed down? Where did it get repeated? Why do we judge others who partake in the physical world and who flourish and who are abundant 
and who appear in front of us as abundant and material and, and really love it here. Why? That's what I want to know. Why? Because beliefs are that powerful. And could that be what's holding us back? And that is why I'm here. And I really did. <laughs> I've devoted my life to this. I've devoted my life to this because nothing was going right for me. My grandmother was dearly beloved and her formula was very traditional, but I've spent so much time on that formula. When nothing goes right, go left. And I did go left and I did find the answers. And I actually spent a time writing a book on these answers and I'm gonna give you the answers today. Would you lie, are you ready for those answers? <laughs> I'm going to give you the answers. There's an answer um, because of time. There's one huge answer in a story that was told 2,000 years ago. It's really startling. But before I give you that answer, because I'm not going to give it to you yet because it's that important, we have to lay a little groundwork first because we have to talk about beliefs. Because remember, words bind or remind us of who we are. And you're going to understand why that is so important. Because why are beliefs so important? Because most spiritual, spiritual or religious teachings still say that in order to become more clear, to be higher, to be holier, to achieve more ascension, just to become better in all wondrous ways, it, whether it is for, through a mantra, through, a, it doesn't matter what it is. We must transcend, we must go away from our physical body, physical presence, physical world. There is a different way. And I'm actually trying to question this and saying, I don't think that's the way. I think it's the opposite. I think it's the opposite way. And I just want us to understand entertain this because the world was flat. I mean, how many years ago until we, we, we had just one little spark, one little question. These are unchallenged, invalidated things until someone questions it. We must continue to question because we don't know the origin of this until we question the origin of these beliefs because this is what I'm going to show you how these are beliefs. But you cannot have it both ways. Either we are perfect, we're made of God's stuff, or everything that the universe made is flawed. Everything the universe made is flawed. It can't be both ways. And as I was growing up as a little girl, and, and, and as you perhaps have been growing up as children, we have been, it, it's just a subjective belief We've been told the same thing. We've, we've, we've not questioned it. It's been taught, handed down. But I still sought solace in the physical world. I went to the woods. I went in front of flowers or trees. I, when I wanted to escape, this is where I found the intrinsic presence. It brought me to my center. So I was confused. You know, the physical world brought me the peace I wanted. And when I grew up, I couldn't bring the trees into the office, into the divorces and in the courtrooms and the dishes and all that everyday life. I couldn't do that. The checkout counters at Target and post office and, you know, life. But I realized that when I grew older, that I wasn't there to let these things. I wasn't there to get through my life, get through my life. We're, tr we're always taught, get through your life because there's a better place. Remember what grandma said, it's a better place. We're not here to get through this life to a better place. We're here to let this everyday physical existence, this physical everyday washing the dishes, line at Target, to-do list, 
We're here to let it shape us, mold us, allow us to show kindness, compassion, generosity. This is our sacred contract. This is our ministry. This is our profound awareness, awakening, enlightenment portal. And it's available 24 seven. And the universe has been unraveling the perfect props, sets, and stage for our reawakening all along. That to-do list was never meant to get done. It was meant for us to plug back in and re-experience on ourselves as physical forms. Because guess what? Suffering is optional, but form is not. We, we are consciousness doing a dance in form. Consciousness is nothingness. It's emptiness without form. We are here to experience ourselves and do a wondrous dance in form. Wow, how delightful that is. Not only that, startlingly, I could no longer align with the spiritual and religious teachings that taught separation and fragmentation. They were preaching wholeness and oneness while still rejecting parts of myself. Like, like some malignant tumor I had or some tooth abscess. Isn't, isn't oneness acceptance of all of our parts? Isn't, isn't, isn't wholeness integration not fragmentation? I felt like I was always trying to become myself, but running away from parts of myself. And there was always parts of me that were unloved, unaccepted, and then projected out onto the world. Well, no wonder why the world, we're oh, everyone thinks the world is crummy. You can't see on the outside what you don't see on the inside. You just can't. The path to true freedom, wholeness, unity, and release lies in total acceptance of oneself, where there is no condemnation, no rejection, where everything simply exists as is. Isn't that, isn't that the way it is? Isn't that the way it should be? And that, that my friends, is what, where I found the answers, where there is no judgment, where everything simply just exists. So, words bind or remind us of who we are. I know you're gonna remember that. <laughs> what, is, what is the current template for enlightenment? Okay, here we go. Leave your day-to-day -day life, go remote. I mean, we, we understand this, go remote. So it's go to a convent, a monastery, under a tree, we're familiar with that story. It's basically go away, you, you need to be quiet. This is, this is what traditionally we're taught, go quiet. Or B, leave your, abstain from the, from the physical world. This is like leaving your, your day to day life. And when you abstain from the physical world, it's the, the more painful the better. Leaving comforts, pleasures, material, because abstinence is a greater reward in the afterlife, or heaven or whatever you want to call that. Um, this is also where we've been trained to, to reward pain over pleasure or struggle over ease. This has been ingrained for thousands of years. A plus B equals C, which it would be enlightenment, which would be awakening. But I'm asking, did any of you ride a horse to the convention center today? No, you didn't, because you've moved on. You've moved on, but then I'm asked, why are we determined to follow a formula that's thousands of years old, that's passed down? That we, have you asked the validity of it? Has it been working for you? But today, why would we be, we have, we have jobs, we have commutes, we have screaming two-year-olds. We have an internet that connects us globally. 
It's not easy to go alone or remote. Enlightenment should be something that we just intrinsically feel and see within us. It, should be easy. it shouldn't be a struggle. We've been taught it's a struggle. It's something you have to do, go, find, or read in a book, or memorize in a 10-step plan. I don't think so. Why do we feel that it should be something? It should be or go or have to do something. Maybe we should question that. Maybe we should question that. By the way, so, are you ready for more? Are you ready for more? Because I got so much more. I can't. I've got so much more. Do you believe in Santa Claus? Who believes in Santa Claus? No, good. But you, but you dressed up as when you were little, right? You dressed up when you were little because when you dressed up as Captain Marvel or whatever, you believed you had those superpowers. You believed when you wore the cape, you could fly. Or you believed when you were, you know, Cinderella, you, you were magical and you had all that stuff. But when your mom told you that the tooth fairy wasn't real, you cried because she lied, and those beliefs were powerful. You mourned the loss of those beliefs, the loss of those powers. Beliefs are that powerful. Myths, which are stories, myths, according to the Wikipedia, are stories. They're, they're, they're unproven, collective stories. And myths are important for us to talk about because that is what I've alluded to in the beginning. I'm going to tell you that story I dug up. Myths were stories that were told to, to re explain our relationship between man and divine. They were um, instructional because we need to know how to behave in our tribes, in our families. And they netted out punishments because, you know, you hear about Zeus and how he used lightning and, and netted out all, all sorts of horrible punishments. And the main point, though, is that they were completely false. They're just made-up stories. These started as um, oral in origin. They were told around campfires. And they later became texts, written sacred texts. And they are what our religions are based on today. So most of our religions are based on made-up, fictional stories, which means that most of our spiritual and religious teachings are based on unproven, unquestioned, made-up, fictional stories which means that most of our spiritual and religious teachings are based on fictitious, subjective beliefs. Things that make you want to go, hmm. Things that make you want to go, hmm. The story that I alluded to earlier, I'm, I'm happy to share with you. The, the most influential story that has the most profound, profound impact on us and our freedom is the Garden of Eden story, Man's Fall of Grace, which you will find in the Genesis portion of the Old Testament. In this story, a woman named Eve naturally, curiously, instinctively reaches for the tree of knowledge, the, the apple, and she gets expelled from the Garden of Eden, the lovely, wondrous, abundant garden that's full of treasures that has been unraveling for us, by us, since the beginning of time. And in this one act, it proves her vile, corrupt, intrinsically lower dense nature. In this one decision, as the story goes, it proves her, her corrupt, her, her yearnings, her shameful longings and desires that are innate to her very physical longing desires that she's born into.
What's more is she is told that if she partakes in any more of these shameful desires and longings in the, in the physical world, in this abundant world and of her body, she will be punished by the very entity that gave her life in a time frame of forever. You know, forever. It's not very long. And she is shamed by this. She is shamed by these innate desires and these longings of this abundance and this material and this beautifulness and these gorgeous, this, everything that was ever made for her, made for us. And from then on, we were offered two choices. Align with the physical world and burn in hell or be shown the way out by the religious authorities and ascend. But by ascending, we would do penance. We would do penance for the original sin we were born into because we were born broken. We were born broken with an innate, intrinsic, sinful, longing, desirous nature. Go figure. Go figure. And we would be doing penance for a crime we would never remember committing and doing time for a, a crime we just we don't remember doing. And we were expelled from the, the Garden of Eden, our physical world, and from then on there would be a permanent split between our physical and spiritual worlds. And that's what you see when you see compartmentalization between religious, religious and spiritual life. You see us going to church if you want to see us getting redeemed because our everyday life it was doomed. Our everyday life was doomed. And we'd have to go to church for an hour and get redeemed. We'd have to go to church. That would be our, our, our way of getting penance and getting, getting better. So I found this very profound too because there is no such thing as religious life, home life, job life. It's all one life. There's no such thing as spiritual life, material life. It's all, it's all one, it's all spiritual. So I need to talk about beliefs because beliefs are so powerful we all know, we all think we know about beliefs, but beliefs start out as unexamined, un, unquestioned, unvalidated thoughts. Like, you know, Jews are cheap, women are inferior, the Reds are going to win the World Series. And these beliefs are not truths, they're not absolutes. They're not like, I have two hands. Those are truths. Those are certains. They start out as unexamined, unquestioned, and they get passed on by our tribe. Now, we, we, do, not, we do not have any meaning until it's given to us by our tribe. We come as blank canvases, and our beliefs get put into our brains, our little receptor vehicles, like puzzle pieces, and they form a lens through which we see the world. And we go out into the world, and that's how we know what's right or wrong. We judge what's right or wrong. We judge our actions and decisions based on this lens we get from our tribe. But these beliefs start out as thoughts, and they gain momentum from being repeated and repeated and passed on to thousands and millions of other human beings. And they form a momentum of all their own. They form a force all their own. And before you know, they dominate our way of behaving, our way of acting. So you know this because have people died for their beliefs? Of course they have. The terrorist for one side is a freedom fighter for another. Do you think that beliefs could be so powerful that they could keep you away from your happiness? Could something that was just, fall, you followed along from the predecessor, you could just, you know, be handed down to you from a, from, a, from a previous generation and you just follow along? You just didn't question it. It was just something you believed. Could it be that powerful? Even if it was keeping you from your happiness, do you think you would just, I mean, follow along? 
I'm going to tell you a fascinating research study done by a colleague of mine, J.R. Stevenson, about some four rhesus monkeys. In this monkey study, there was a ripe set of bananas suspended from a pole. And of course, there were four monkeys in the cage, and one of the monkeys, when she got hungry, she scrambled up to reach the, the ripe bananas. And when she went up to get the bananas, a torrent of cold water was sprayed on her, and she scampered down the pole. And she, after several attempts, she never reached back up for the bananas again. And one by one, the monkeys went up to reach for the bananas. And one by one, they would get squirted by the cold hose of water. And after several attempts, they never reached up for the bananas again. That one monkey was replaced and replaced by a new monkey. And when she reached up to get the bananas, the other three monkeys screeched and screeched and they pulled her down so that she would not go up for the bananas. And after several attempts, the new monkey did not go up to the pole to reach the bananas. Now, the other three monkeys were gradually replaced one by one with new monkeys. And one by one, of course, they all reached for the bananas, but they were all taken down by the other ones. And gradually, all the monkeys were replaced, so there were no original monkeys in that cage. But yet, none of the monkeys went near the bananas or near the pole. And not one of them questioned why. And not one of them knew why. And that, my friends, is the power of beliefs. How many of us are merely imitating the thoughts of our predecessors? Or merely imitating the, the actions of our predecessors? Just because they've been passed on. Just because they've been passed on. And we're not reaching out for the bananas, for our beautiful lives, because it's been handed down. But we're not questioning it, we're not challenging it, we're not validating it, because we're just believing that it's true. It's a powerful study. So, <laughs> imagine though, what this is costing us. Oh, imagine what this is costing us. As this mythical story, this mythical story of Adam and Eve is being passed, has been passed down for thousands of years from generation to generation, just like the monkeys. We haven't questioned this story. We haven't validated it. We haven't questioned it. We haven't challenged it. And so here we are, we're, we're, we're on the mass of a, of a, we're on the verge of a mass reawakening. We're trying to wake up, but we're not growing up. We're not growing up, we refuse to grow up. We're still stuck in a blind mythical story. It's like being 60 years old and still playing with your Legos and Tinker Toys. We, we are still trying to become ourselves, but still trying to run away from ourselves. We're still trying to be whole, but still fragmented into little pieces, thinking that we can become spiritual, but yet we're still, we're still running away from the physical portion of who we are, believing that it's wrong, that it's inferior, because it's based on some, some tribal belief, some subjective belief. We need to question this. Perhaps it's time to question this. Our, our, our body, our body is not the problem. Our world is not the problem. It's not that we, we don't chant enough, fast enough, pray enough, do enough mantras, blah, 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 blah. It, could it be that it's the belief we had about the body the belief we had in the world, the belief we have in the formula 
the blind investment we have in the story, the story that's getting, that got us here. And you know, there's really, there's no one to blame because blame keeps us stuck in the same mindset that says, if I were, if this were different or if that were different, if I, you know, if I had only known, it's the same stuck mindset that said, if I had, oh my gosh, something's missing, I'm broken, I need to fix something. And that just keeps us stuck. And the Buddha was known to have said, if you knew how perfect everything was, you would tilt your head back in the sky and laugh. And I, um, I really want to tell you, uh, to hone this really back in, I, I want to tell you, I, 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 I just love saying this, from my book, <laughs> I've waited so long to say that, I want to tell you a story from my book. Welcome to the airport of Eden. Welcome to the airport of Eden. You, my friends, <laughs> are at an airport called the Airport of Eden. It is a spectacular airport filled with beauty and light. It has high vaulted ceilings and the most spectacular array of colors, sights and sounds. It is an airport bustling with activity and restlessness. Throngs of people everywhere and most of them are lugging large, bulky suitcases. On top of these suitcases are stacks of books, newspapers, and clippings that spill onto the floor, leaving a trail of debris. The passengers' ears are covered with headsets, delivering the latest tips for fixing something about themselves, while overhead the monitors are blaring about impending dangers everywhere. The travelers are looking for their gates, each of which is labeled a destination that will deliver an amazing experience. As they pass by the gates half-heartedly, the travelers inspect them, not knowing which ones to choose. Each gate seems to have something missing, or something that needs to be changed or fixed. So the travelers move on. They, they, they drag their baggage with them, but never seem to find a gate that's suitable. This seed of doubt keeps them in limbo, unable to decide which gate to check into, for they don't feel any of these gates are right. And of course, there could be a better one farther down. Some of the travelers feel the destinations are too far away or too expensive. They don't feel they have the money, the time, or requirements for such destinations. So they keep walking past the gates, hoping to find one that's better fit for them. Along the way, they keep passing kiosks and shops, each with a stack of books, a newspaper, a magazine, a souvenir. So many of these items are interesting or possibly helpful in deciding which gate to choose. Positive, you know, this may, CD may be just what they need. Maybe another book to help them discover what's missing. Just one more fix for focus, one more piece of advice to empower them to make the leap. One never knows. It could be just the right elixir or antidote to calm their nerves. The travelers pile more of these purchases on top of their other purchases, on top of their already heavy baggages. They could just heal that part of themselves that went wrong. If they could just figure out a way to stop being who they are and try to become who they were taught to become, then maybe they would know which gate to choose. In a state of awareness, you, you are sitting in that lounge, witnessing this scene through open doors. You, my friends, are having a drink. You, my friends, are eating a delicious dinner. You are thoroughly enjoying the experience of the moment and just grateful to be a part of it all. You know that as you sit there, you know that it will not matter which gate you choose. It just matters that you choose one of them. All of the planes will be going 
going to the same destination. And all of them will have the same outcome. You know there's no rush because the journey was the destination all along. The most important part of this journey was to simply enjoy the experience because you, you are perfect underneath. There is not another human being like you. Your uniqueness in every respect is your gift. Life asks one thing of you, one, to be the full expression of yourself so that you can leave your unique imprint on all those you encounter and upon the world. Never, never underestimate the power of your energy and how it ripples outward to affect everything and everyone around you if, if you are being your full authentic self. Could it be, could it be that we have misidentified, erroneously misidentified this physical world, this, this body of ours as the hindrance behind our reawakening? Could it be that all along the universe has been unraveling the perfect set, the perfect props, the perfect stage for us to experience everything we wanted to do in the Garden of Eden? Could it be that we have been like Dorothy on the Wizard of Oz, going down this yellow brick road like freaking morons, trying to seek out the wizard and antidotes and people and elixirs and, and, and ten step plans and we get to the wizard and what happens? He is a illusion. He has no power. And what happens to Dorothy? She's told you had the power all along. And she even has a glittery set of red shoes. And when she asked Glinda the Good Witch, she says, why didn't you just tell me? And Glinda says, because you would not have believed me. You had to find it out for yourself. You would not have believed me. You know why? Because beliefs are that powerful. Because beliefs are that powerful. Someone reached out for a forbidden fruit, and we have been paying for that ever since. You know, it spread, it, it, it spread like a worldwide virus, and it just infected everyone that it came into contact with. But it doesn't have to anymore. You know, beliefs can be challenged, they can be questioned, they can be validated. And this, you know, enlightenment as a formula, it just doesn't work, it doesn't work. It can never be a 10-step plan or something you can memorize when it's a revelation of what was already there. All those solutions were aimed at someone who has a problem and, and none of you have a problem. You were never broken and there was never anything to fix. Never, never. Oh, I just have to tell you that with new awareness, you can solve an old problem in a new way. All it takes is a 1% shift. You can walk out of this door with a completely new consciousness level because that's all it takes. The path to true unity, freedom, and wholeness lies in total acceptance, where nothing is condemned, nothing is judged, nothing is rejected, transcended, or blamed. Where all exists as is. Where all exists as is. Stop, we gotta stop healing the problems we never had. There is a new way of being in this world a new way of existing where things rock on all cylinders, physical, mental, spiritual, all of it. We have better things to do with our energy and better ways to use our, our lives. This world really is too good to miss. It really is too good to miss. 
If you knew how perfect and how magnificent you are, it would scare the magnificence right out of you. And I will be here reminding you of this magnificence until the day you can see it in yourself. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much.